on the waiting room, but okay. should we kick off a little bit? Let's thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for coming along tonight. Um, really nice to see so many familiar faces of the Wild Winchester group. Um, and obviously uh, this is the second one of our talks, having had uh, Keith a few weeks back. Um, tonight we've got Paul Reynolds from um, the Heart Wildlife Rescue. Um, he's going to do us a talk on the, the wonderful organisation. Uh, hopefully if you've been on the board for you know, more than a few months you will have seen uh, regular updates from them so um, I'm really looking forward to this one tonight so with no further ado I'll just hand across to Paul really looking forward to this and I'll speak to you all later thanks Simon thank you I'm sorry I'm going to I'm going to just quickly jump in rather confusingly I'm actually listed here as, as Paul Reynolds because we're using we're using Paul's heart zoom subscription um, I'm just going to say a couple of words my name's Eleanor Marsden and I'm one of the trustees at Heart Wildlife Rescue um, I just wanted to welcome you really on behalf of the organization a um, couple of little bits to let you know uh, the session is obviously going to be recorded uh, as with as with the the talk that Keith gave um, if you're a clandestine member of Wild Winchester or don't want to be seen um, by all means turn off your your video um, but just so you know it will be a recorded session um, Paul is going to, I'll introduce Paul in a second, but Paul is going to do your talk this evening. Um, we're going to have a bit of time at the end for um, questions. Can I ask everybody if you uh, can, uh, ha while the talk is going on, if you have any questions to type them in the chat box. And then what we'll do is curate some questions for the end um, and make sure that everybody has a chance to, to ask things. So whilst the question ar um, arises, pop it in the chat box and we'll make sure that that gets asked at the end of the session. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to see so many people here. Um, I want to hand over uh, formally to, to Paul. Um, Paul uh, Reynolds, as you know, is Hart's hospital manager. Um, he joined us in 2019 um, and has been officially the manager of the hospital uh, since the beginning of last year. Um, we, uh, we're really, really delighted to have Paul working with us. He's got a wealth of experience. He was previously working at Hesselhead and has had a fantastically global career working with wildlife around the world, including in Costa Rica and with the Born Free Foundation. So I think you're going to have a really interesting session tonight. As I say, I know we can't speak to each other. I know we can't necessarily have a chat, but please, by all means, use the chat box. Um, feel free to ask questions and um, uh, without further ado, I'll pass over to the official Paul, <laughs> rather than my one. So, hi, Paul. Over hey to everyone. You. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Simon. Um, obviously, I'm going to go through a, a talk with everybody. I'm going to be sharing my screen as I have a presentation. Um, we're going to have a look through uh, a little bit about Heart for those of you that aren't necessarily familiar with us and what we're all about and, and where we are actually based. And then we're going to have a look at some of our admissions from last year, some of our data. Uh, we're going to have a look at some Winchester case studies. Uh, and then we're going to move on to a few other bits and bobs, what to do if you find an injured animal, and ways that you can help our organization as well. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. Give, don't forgive me if it all goes terribly wrong for a moment. And, uh, and let's see how this goes. There we go. Right. So I hope you can all see this. I'm sure my phone will start buzzing if something's gone terribly wrong. Um, righty then, so who are Hart? Uh, we were actually founded in 1996 by Bob and June Gibbs. Um, we were originally known as the Hampshire Animal Rescue Team. That's where the Hart, actually the acronym, unlike the Hart uh, Regional District, uh, actually came from. So Hampshire Animal Rescue Team was our original name and, and still forms part of the, of the base of our name today. We are a registered charity. Uh, we moved to our new premises in Medstead near Alton in 2010. You can see the photograph here of the front of our hospital and our ambulance there. We are open seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're always busy and working away rescuing wildlife. Um, you can get a hold of us 24 hours a day, although the hospital line is only manned during hostel opening hours. And there are contact details on the answer machine for out of hours emergencies. And um, we've got a team of staff and dedicated volunteers here that enable us to operate. And in fact, all of us have been working very hard over the last year, albeit on a reduced team, 
uh, to keep our sort of services going. Our sort of mission statement is to relieve suffering amongst wildlife in need of care and attention, and in particular by the provision of a rescue and rehabilitation service for abandoned, neglected or injured wildlife. So therefore we are all about British wildlife. This is where we are in relation to the centre of Winchester. A lot of people ask where we are. It's something that I think we're not the clearest signposted uh, organisation in the world, but we're just up the A31, just past Olsford, and just before four marks, uh, you'll find us there. So moving on to our 2020 admissions. One of the things that people ask us all the time is, you know, we get a, a good reputation for our hedgehog rescue work. And some people are surprised to hear that actually hedgehogs do not make up the majority of the work that we do. Um, our total admissions in 2020 numbered 3,233, of which birds, avian species, actually make up the, the vast majority uh, of our intake. And you can see on this graph here a bit of an idea of how the year works. So starting off in January, as we're at right now, um, it's generally the quietest time of year. So you will find that there's a relatively even mix of avian patients and mammal patients coming in. So currently uh, on site, for example, we have uh, lots of pigeons at the moment, wood pigeons, feral pigeons. Uh, we've got lots of hedgehogs um, and, and a few collared doves, and a couple of tawny owls, and, and that pretty much makes up what's on site currently. It's a relatively quiet time of year. Now, as you see from the graph, as we move through the year, uh, January to February starts to pick up a bit sluggish into March. There's a general increase, but it's very manageable. Then you'll notice that suddenly you hit April and into May and, and it skyrockets. Now, of course, as you can see from the graph, the orange line being birds, that is, of course, a vast majority of baby birds and juvenile birds that start to come into the rescue centre. So during particularly uh, May, June and July, the entire rescue centre is swamped with baby birds. All of our incubators, critical care units and cages are all really, really focused on, on the avian patients. But throughout the year, you'll notice that the mammals are, are slowly but gradually increasing. Now, although we rescue um, deer, foxes, badgers, um, all sorts of rodents, rabbits, hares and bats, it's the hedgehogs that are the largest intake of any mammal throughout the year. And that blue line is really influenced by, by the hedgehog admissions. And you can see this general pattern through the year peaking around June and July, which is quite typical with the hoglets uh, and all of that activity. Um, we'll see a lot of those coming in. And then you'll see a second peak for mammals in November. And again, that's very typical. It's the busiest month for hedgehogs. Uh, I think last November we had about 120 hedgehogs come in. Um, these, a lot of them are autumn juveniles and individuals that get themselves in trouble uh, prior, prior to the winter starting. So that explains that sort of relationship that you'll see. And this is very typical, of course, for any wildlife rescue center that's, that generalizes in, in what they rescue. You'll see this pattern no matter how many animals they rescue in a year. If we have a look at our admissions table from 2020, we've broken it down to some basic groups to give you a bit of an idea of how those figures uh, sort of come about. So deers, the vast majority of deer that, that we have to attend are normally hit by cars or mauled by dogs. That, that's the most common reason for us uh, attending a deer. The occasional one stuck in a fence, but the vast majority, unfortunately, by the very nature of deer, um, are, are very bad cases. And, and, and a lot of the time, unfortunately, we're called out to dispatch um, deer that are beyond, um, beyond repair. Uh, we don't get many badgers at heart. We're not very well equipped for long-term badger care. So most of the badgers that came in this year were very young. Um, we took care of them, got them stable, and then sent them on to a, a, a more suited rescue center for badgers. Uh, they're very specialist species and require quite very specific sort of enclosures. Uh, we had a lot of foxes this year, a mixture of fox cubs and, and adult foxes. You can see on the right-hand side there a picture of a fox cub called Alex. Um, as a cub on the left side of the photo and then as a, a sort of teenager before she was released uh, on the right hand side. Um, foxes, again, they peak sort of March, April time. Uh, lots of cubs come in. They all need hand rearing and they can't be released again until September time. So you have them for the, for the whole year. 
rabbits and hares throughout the year. We get lots of baby rabbits. Um, hares here and there. We don't get as many hares uh, as rabbits. Uh, we do get lots of baby rabbits, rabbit kits as they're called, uh, that come in. And my partner Morgan is the sort of baby rearer, the expert baby rearer here. And she takes care of lots of those uh, young rabbits that come in. Stoats and weasels. Um, we get lots of bats in at heart. Um, interestingly enough, in this part of the world, uh, we get a lot of the brown long-eared bats and you will see them on our social media from time to time. Uh, they're quite charismatic looking. Um, so we get a lot of bats in, mostly because they've been caught out in bad weather or they've become hypothermic and sort of grounded. Now rodents and small insectivorous, by that we really mean mice and voles and shrews. We do get the old mole as well. Most of these come in as cat victims um, or young babies found out. Um, cold in someone's garden. Uh, quite busy with the birds of prey over 2020. We had 97 uh, birds of prey uh, and that was a mixture of owls, kites, buzzards, kestrels. Uh, we had a couple of hobbies uh, as well um, and a few sparrow hawks. So that again owls make up the majority of our bird of prey intake with the tawny owl of course being the common one. Most of the time we're either talking about the owlets, most of which of the tawny owlets we get around May time, April, May time. Um, otherwise, it's birds of prey that have been hit by cars. Uh, unfortunately, it's very common, particularly on the Winchester Road. Uh, we had a bit of an influx of gulls this year. Not everybody's favourite bird, but they are wonderful creatures and very interesting to look at. Um, we had a, a transfer of them from a rescue centre on the Isle of Wight that was inundated by them and needed somewhere to hand some of theirs over. So we had a lot of herring gulls, uh, lesser blackback, um, black-headed uh, and greater blackback gull in as well. Um, so it was quite an impressive mix. Uh, as you would imagine, pigeons and doves, uh, feral pigeons, wood pigeons, collared doves, uh, and the odd domestic pigeon, uh, they're quite common. Uh, they're not always the most intelligent animals, and they do end up in precarious situations, so, so they're quite common in here. Garden birds, of course, if we're looking at avian patients overall, the garden birds make up the vast majority of those patients that we see in the air. So blackbirds, uh, various tits, goldfinches, robins, we had all sorts in this year. Uh, and again, on our social media, you can see more detailed breakdowns of these statistics. Uh, waterfowl uh, and wading birds, the vast majority of which are mallards and swans that we get in at heart. Um, mallard ducklings, I think, were, were about 110 of that 173 figure. So we rescued uh, an awful lot of ducklings this year, often because they end up in people's gardens uh, far away from any water or they're in a sort of busy urban area and people panic. So we end up coming out to sort of get them. Uh, we do get the odd reptile and amphibian. Uh, most of the reptiles that come in are grass snakes. Um, some, we, a few of the patients this year were caught in netting on people's allotments uh, or they were caught by cats, of course. And with grass snakes, they often play dead. So when they're playing dead, um, people think it is severely injured. We often hear that the snake has a dislocated jaw, um, but it's all part of that posture that they do when they're playing dead uh, that makes people think they're very, very injured. We also had, uh, you'll see a, a sign there so for, for others, um, we get the odd domestic and exotic animal in. And in fact, you'll see here uh, some of our more unusual patients of 2020. Now going from left to right, we have a, a, a budgie in the top left that actually landed on somebody's head uh, over towards Fleet. She was out in the park and it just landed on her head out of nowhere. They called us asking us what to do. And we said, well, catch it, uh, pop, pop it in a box um, and bring it into us. And, and then from here, we can try and find the owner. And lo and behold, within about 20 minutes of it being on our social media, um, somebody reported that they'd lost um, a, a white budgie about three miles away three days prior. So they came and looked and it was indeed the same bird. Uh, there was a bit of a reaction from the bird as well. And it was nice to be able to reunite them. Uh, the next one along is a diamond dove. Um, you will occasionally see these escapees in your garden feeding at feeders. Uh, again, this individual was escaped from someone's aviary in Basingstoke. Uh, after somebody broke in um, and damaged the aviaries, a lot of them escaped. This one turned up and we were able to reunite it. 
Now, a very unusual patient next, and we couldn't believe it when we heard it on the phone. Obviously, we do have to try and guess what species are on the phone sometimes. Uh, this is actually a rhea, uh, a bird that you would not expect uh, to be roaming around uh, in the UK. And actually, what had happened was uh, there was a family on holiday in Dartmoor National Park. They picked up this baby rhea, and they seemed to know it was a rhea, um, and they brought it back to Southampton. Then they called us saying they had a baby rear and we thought, oh, we thought it was going to be a pheasant or something. Um, and they turned up and lo and behold, it was. Um, after much reaching out on social media, the post went viral, various media outlets got in touch with us about it. Nobody came forward from where it was found to say they'd lost one. Um, so it ended up going to a sanctuary all the way over in Somerset um, who had, a, had similar aged rear. Uh, and since then, it's been growing up there and, and they actually use them to help maintain the, the land there. Next along was a snake. Um, it is a corn snake, uh, actually from New Hampshire. They're present in New Hampshire. So this caused a bit of confusion identifying it online originally. Um, somebody in Basingstoke said it had a snake in their garden. Uh, they took a photo of it, but they'd already let it go before it came through to us. Uh, and we realized it wasn't a native snake and it was in fact a, a type of corn snake. And we asked them to look out for it, but the, to no avail, it disappeared. And then 12 days later, we had a call from somebody else on the same street, having found an unusual snake in their garden. They sent a photograph and lo and behold, it was the same snake. So they caught it and brought it into us and we rehomed it with one of our volunteers um, after nobody came forward to say they'd lost one. Uh, the bottom left was a bit of a sad story. This was a hamster found in Basingstoke in the park. Unfortunately, it was in a very poor condition. You can see here we're, we're giving it some rehydration fluids. Uh, it was dehydrated. Uh, unfortunately, it had a nasty injury on its back. Um, in the end, it actually had to be put to sleep, unfortunately. Next along, we had a cockatiel. Uh, that was quite an interesting patient. That came in again, landed on someone's head. Um, we had a cockerel turn up that was allegedly a pheasant. Uh, quite quickly, it became apparent that that was indeed not a pheasant. Cockerels are notoriously difficult to rehome, but we did actually find a rescue centre to take it on. And last but not least was this uh, albino um, ferret that came in. We do get a few ferrets throughout the year. And again, we work with a ferret rescue over Winchester Way uh, who rehome them for us or indeed reunite them with their owners. So our facilities at heart, for those of you that, that are not familiar with us or haven't seen our setup before, um, we have four treatment and recovery rooms and an isolation unit. Um, the green cabins there are part of the isolation unit. Obviously that sort of design is to keep those patients away from all the other animals in the hospital um, because they may be infectious or carrying highly infectious um, diseases. Our hospital can house over 300 animals at the busiest time. So that's within the hospital and within um, on the field where our aviaries are. And there's a whole variety of different boxes and cages and, and critical care units. You can see some of the critical care incubators there in the top right. Um, there's a whole variety of things. Not everything, unfortunately, in the, in the veterinary world is, is made for wildlife. So when it comes to wildlife rescue and rehabilitation, we have to improvise and, and have things custom made sometimes to suit, to suit the animals. We also have our own ambulance, which we can use for transporting and picking up um, critical patients, particularly patients that you can't expect members of the public to deal with, foxes, deer, badgers, swans and geese. Um, so we use that where we can. Of course, primarily we're a wildlife hospital, but we do have our rescue service as well. And we do have our outdoor enclosures and aviaries on a field that's adjacent to the hospital. So you can see the field here in the top right. Uh, there's actually quite a few more enclosures on there now, actually, since I took that photo uh, earlier this last year. Um, it gives you a bit of a snapshot. There's a variety of buildings and aviaries. Um, we've got larger flight aviaries for birds of prey and smaller aviaries for garden birds, medium sized sort of aviaries for corvids uh, and larger enclosures for foxes um, and temporary patients such as badgers and deer. As I say, we'd only hold on to those temporarily um, because they require, well, for deer, you need something the size of the entire field really if you're going to keep them long term. So common reasons for admission. If we were looking at the data from last year, what, what were the, the common reasons that these animals came into us? Uh, cat attacks are, are very common for small mammals and for garden birds. Um, being found orphaned uh, or query orphaned, as is sometimes the case, 
um, is, is quite common. So that's obviously where someone finds a young hedgehog or what they perceive to be a young hedgehog. Uh, they pick it up uh, as an example uh, and bring it into us thinking it's been abandoned or it's too young. Um, we always advise to give us a call first before intervening in these situations just so we can ascertain what's going on. But found orphan is quite common. Road traffic accidents, obviously, very common. Birds of prey, deer, foxes, badger, uh, many of these ending up being clipped by cars or, or hit by cars. Uh, litter related is not as common as you would imagine, thankfully. Um, but, you know, we do get litter patients. You know, hedgehogs, we had one that was caught in a, the handle of a plastic bag and it had dug deep into its neck. Um, had to be surgically removed. Um, that patient actually made a full recovery, which was nice. Um, you can see on the images here, there's a um, black-headed gull, a young black-headed gull, that's got a fishing hook uh, through its beak. Uh, its tongue was actually poking out through the bottom of the beak there. Um, that, again, all removed, uh, fully recovered, uh, and released about sort of 10 days after the event, actually. Um, poisoning uh, is not always easy to ascertain. There are certain sort of things that you look for with poisoning. Um, you can do various diagnostics. We could send them to our registered veterinary practice for blood tests or x-rays um, if, we're, if we're concerned for poisoning. Um, quite often you'll see that with birds of prey that have eaten poison rodents. Um, but normally uh, those patients, by the time they're admitted into wildlife hostel or veterinary practice, unfortunately they're normally on their, on their way out. Uh, animals that become trapped, so in drainage, in gutters, um, in your sort of uh, cattle grids and things, uh, tangled in football nets and tennis nets. Um, so being trapped in things or stuck in things is, is quite a common cause of emission as well. And disease. There is a whole variety, and that would be a whole other talk, about diseases and viruses um, that we see in, in British wildlife. Um, and again, it's, it, it is a common reason for admission. Gardening hazards, particularly over lockdown, when a lot of people, and, and now, have a lot of time in their garden, uh, made up a lot of the uh, initial admissions from last year. The reasons within a garden uh, vary. Strimmers and lawnmowers. Um, we had uh, quite a few hedgehogs that have been hit by strimmers. You can see an example of one here on the right-hand side, where his nose has actually been partially amputated um, by a strimmer. You'll see hedgehogs come in uh, sometimes with horrific injuries, sometimes with superficial injuries from strimmers. Sometimes they've just lost the top of their spines on their head, you know, very lucky greys, um, but they are very problematic. We had a pheasant um, locally here uh, that was sitting on a nest that was run over the lawnmower. Um, thankfully, we managed, although the pheasant uh, perished uh, immediately, uh, we managed to actually um, recover the, the finder, recovered the eggs and brought them into us, and they were all hatched and released again, so it wasn't too much of a sad story in the end. Um, bonfires are common, um, both through people gardening and then towards bonfire night. Um, everything from birds, young birds, you know, when fledgling birds end up on the ground, they'll often hang around bonfires. If you've got them in spring and summer and you've left a big pile of sticks and things, we did have a blackbird come in uh, juvenile this year that got stuck in a fire, unfortunately. Um, equally, hedgehogs, uh, rodents and things, you know, you light the fire, suddenly someone hears a noise or sees a smoking animal running out of it. Um, it's always worth taking down the fire, rebuilding it if it's, if it's been left there for any length of time. Um, clearing leaves and vegetation in the garden, that was quite common over lockdown as well, and people find hedgehogs that are, have made a nest. A hedgehog nest isn't very obvious. Uh, it's something that, that can literally be, be intertwined with, with the leaf litter uh, under a tree. Um, a lot of people were taking down sheds and cutting down trees over spring and summer. Um, this is problematic for a whole host of reasons. I know it has to be done, but we should always be very cautious. Um, lots of nesting birds, obviously, over spring and summer. Um, foxes in particular and hedgehogs like to nest under sheds as well. A lot of hedgehogs are mating when they come out of hibernation. Uh, once you get through to sort of, you know, well, they start mating April, uh, March, April time into May, and they start having their babies May, June, July. Um, and you, of course, you'll have them under sheds and, and under leaf litter and even plastic bags in the garden are quite common places for them to try to nest. So always move with caution. 
Uh, people often think that if they're in an urban or suburban area, that there's not much wildlife, but it is, it is around. And an awful lot of wildlife is admitted, you know, due to these, these issues within the garden. Cutting hedges was a frustrating issue this year. You really shouldn't be cutting hedges uh, in springtime and summertime. It is a ideally an autumn winter activity, um, purely because of the sheer volume of, of sort of nesting birds that you'll find out there. Uh, that unfortunately, you know, the cutter comes along, you don't see the nest, uh, mom gets scared off, the nest gets knocked out, suddenly there's baby birds everywhere uh, and they're sort of being rushed into us. So I wanted to go through some Winchester case studies with you because of course many of you are tuning in from the Winchester area and we do have an awful lot of traffic from Winchester. Um, it's, we don't have all of our data because obviously not everybody agrees to share their personal data with us when they hand a patient over. Uh, and of course, many of our patients come from veterinary practices as well where there is no known location. And we get an awful lot of wildlife patients actually from Winnor, from Mild May Veterinary Practice. And again, we don't always know where they came from, but there's a good chance they came from the Winchester area. But if we look at the patients that we do know, at least 200 cases from Winchester in 2020. Um, hedgehogs and pigeons are the most common um, for, for calls for admission from Winchester. You've got a very, very healthy hedgehog population. I'm sure many of you tuning in are big fans of hedgehogs uh, and you're probably feeding the hedgehogs and see them in your garden as well on frequent basis. So they do make up a, a large proportion of it. And um, we get, again, this is hard to quantify, but of the data we do have, we get over 300 calls from the Winchester area per year as well. So of course, a, a good part of our job here obviously is the rescue of wildlife, the treating and releasing of wildlife. That's a big part of what we do. But an awful lot of our time is also spent giving advice on the telephone. And that advice may be to take an animal into a, a more, uh, to a nearer port of rescue, um, particularly if it's a critical patient that sounds like it's not going to make it. Um, and also sometimes that advice is that that bird is perfectly fine, that, that fledgling bird, uh, please leave it alone and keep an eye on it. Um, and of course, once you get to the busy season here, which as you saw from the graph runs roughly from May, uh, well, April, May, all the way through to September time, uh, the phone is nonstop all day long. So to begin with, uh, we'll have a look at a, a case study involving a badger cub that came in. It was found stumbling around uh, on the Ulsford Road by the M3 near Winchester. Uh, it was roughly eight to nine weeks old. Um, and unfortunately, when it arrived, it was hypothermic. It was really dehydrated. Um, and as it started to stabilize, because of course, priority when an animal comes in is to stabilize it with warmth and fluids. Um, we could see that there were some serious puncture wounds. You can see them in the top right photo just about there on the back of the neck. Now it gives you a bit of an idea of the size of those puncture wounds in relation to the size of the animal. But unfortunately, it was a very serious case. Um, once the animal was stable, we rushed it down to our registered veterinary practice um, where they take us in straight away. Um, we went in with the with the and uh, this was during lockdown as well, of course, um, there's lots of complications of lockdown for everybody, uh, uh, but also in wildlife rescue is the same. Um, X-rays unfortunately showed um, there was a severe fracture of the C1 vertebrae, so the cervical vertebrae at the base of the neck, um, which correlates where those puncture wounds are actually. Um, that injury for a badger um, in particular was just not compatible with long-term survival. These are animals that have very, very stocky build and they're all about sort of fighting and defending the territory and uh, sort of fighting off challenging uh, other groups and things. Any, the, any kind of unstable fracture in, in, in the vertebrae in those areas uh, is going to be a lifelong issue for that animal. And obviously you can never release animals that are, are going to suffer or, or cannot thrive. Um, unfortunately, the, the vets agreed that the only option uh, was euthanasia in this case. On to a happier case study, um, aptly named a partridge chick. Um, this is a red-legged partridge. Uh, they were fa one was found alone in July. Um, single chicks do not do well in captivity. For anyone that's familiar with, with uh, sort of ground birds in particular, if you have any domestics, um, they, it, when they come on their own, they, they don't thrive. They become depressed or they become tame because they'll latch on to a human or, or some form of contact. So lone 
checks of this type don't do very well. Um, so we put it in once it was stable with two shell ducklings originally. You can see them there. Um, you have to improvise in this sector of work. There are no absolutes. Um, you have to sometimes do whatever it's going to be to get that animal through. Uh, and thankfully, three days later, another partridge chick found um, alone uh, in the middle of Winchester, this one, um, came in. You can see them on the right-hand side there in those photographs. Um, they grew up together here. Uh, and they were the last sort of two partridge, young partridges of the year. Uh, and they, they were reared here, they grew up here, uh, and they were also released here on site. We're quite lucky to be in a very rural area, and it allows us to release a whole variety of wildlife um, that's in keeping with, with the area, and there's lots of partridges around here. Um, and we've seen them throughout the whole summer. They kept coming back for bird feed. You can see them here uh, not long before release, of course. You know, they don't have to be released when they're fully plumed adults, as you're probably more familiar with seeing them. As soon as they're independent uh, and they've got all their skills for survival and they can fly and everything else, uh, then they can go off and, and, and sort of live their lives. Um, the Garnia Road Swan, this was shared on Wild Winchester and it was shared on our social media as well. It was quite a popular post. Um, it was originally found and called in by Hampshire police. You can see the police car on the top right there. Uh, they reported a swan that was originally uh, sitting in the middle of Garnia Road. Uh, they managed to usher it to the side of the road. Uh, obviously, with swans, we don't expect members of the public to attempt to pick them up. They, if you're not familiar with them, they appear quite intimidating. They're not actually intimidating, and they're more afraid of you uh, than you are of them when you're familiar with them. But um, we went out for it straight away, and we got down to it and found it on the grassy verge there. Now, when we attended, there was a family of swans behind where there was a lone uh, female with some youngsters, and initially, we just assumed that this male, uh, this cob swan was, was actually from that group and that something was obviously, you know, gone quite wrong for him to leave the group and not be protecting them um, and to be sitting on the side and, and we're worrying that it was, it was quite a serious case originally. Um, later on from uh, a member of Wild Winchester got in touch with us after seeing the story and he actually follows the swans um, all around Winchester. He's an artist, uh, he's drawing them and he makes these um, sort of sculptures of these bronze sculptures of them. Um, and he saw our post and actually knew this individual swan and actually knew the family behind and, and he actually had seen this male swan having been dispersed during uh, some waterworks that had been going on deeper in near Winall. Uh, there has been a lot of work going on with the waterways there, and this one actually had been kicked off the, off the water there. Um, so he wasn't actually related to this group. Um, upon examination back at, at, at here, the initial physical examination, we could feel there was a mass in his esophagus, um, roughly the size of a, of a sort of, uh, if you pop two peas together, um, it was about that, and it was hard uh, and a very unusual mass. We assumed it was probably a lead weight um, from a fishing line. So, of course, in any case like that, even if the animal appears otherwise fine, obviously it's straight to the vets for x-ray. Um, and an x-ray did show the mass. Um, they did a small uh, opening, a little keyhole surgery, removed the mass, um, which then... Um, they, they discovered was was just a, some kind of artifact, um, probably from the water, but it was lodged in there. Uh, we removed that. A couple of weeks later, um, antibiotics and, and feeding up, uh, the swan was strong enough and, and, and ready to go uh, back to a different stretch of water. It's important that you don't release swans uh, next to a family of swans, because all that's going to happen is there's going to be lots of combat and fighting, and your recently released swan is likely to get pushed off that water and, and end up with trouble again. And next up, I've got a, a video of this one being released. Uh, and let's see if the wonders of technology will allow us to see that. Um, the frame rate might be a bit slow, but let's have a look. This was him going back um, to a stretch of the River Itchen. Now, when it comes to releasing 
wildlife it, it absolutely is the is the perk of our job um you know you've got the high adrenaline rescuing of animals and of course that's good fun but it's also quite stressful and you have um a lot of issues with that you know you're dealing with unwell animals and it's, it's quite a uh, quite an endeavor and then you have the treatment stage rehabilitation stage obviously that's something we all enjoy in this sector of work and then the real rewarding bit is seeing that animal go back to the wild uh, and when that animal goes and, and you see it for sometimes it's a young animal that you've reared uh, and you get to see it gets first taste of freedom. Uh, equally, when you've got animals like that swan and you let them go on the river and they're, you know, they're flapping their wings and they're, they're really free once more. That really is the rewarding part. Um, we've got a case study here of a feral pigeon from Winchester. Now, I know some people, a lot of people, in fact, will say to us, uh, they wonder why, why the fascination with feral pigeons? Why do we take them on? A lot of people see them as being problematic. Now, as somebody that has worked with wildlife all over the world, I've worked with everything from parrots and parakeets, this is bird related, parrots and parakeets to, to feral pigeons, all sorts of creatures. The feral pigeon, without a doubt, is one of the sweetest animals I've ever worked with. And as youngsters, um, they, are, they are really quite remarkable creatures um, and ask anybody that works in this sector of work what their favorite little bird to work with is and I, I guarantee you they're going to tell you it's, it's, a, it's a baby pigeon it's the feral baby feral pigeons in this individual a uh, member of the public witnessed children kicking uh, the bird they were attacking it basically and trying to kick it in onto the main road in Winchester um, Thankfully, the member of the public was able to intervene uh, and, and saved it because, you know, obviously it was going to get killed or squashed. Um, as young pigeons at this age, uh, they're very vulnerable and they're not particularly afraid of people uh, and they're, they're, they're vulnerable to people that want to do them harm. Uh, the pigeon arrived uh, dehydrated and it had an injury to the wing, probably from being kicked. Now, the dehydration would suggest that the feral pigeon had probably wandered away from its nest uh, a bit too soon, or maybe it had attempted flight, ended up on the ground, um, and then had spent uh, a, a good few hours away from, from its parents. Um, eventually, however, you know, with all these patients that come in, we start off with the rehydration fluids and we build them up. Um, it didn't take long for this pigeon to recover. He had a, a sprained wing that recovered within about seven to eight days. Um, you can see the wing is stabilized there. It's quite important to take the pressure off, um, off any injuries. Um, fluids started to self-feed. Uh, once they're self-feeding, uh, our job is made a lot easier. Otherwise, we have to feed them by tubes. Uh, we have to do that three, four times a day. So it's great when they start self-feeding. Um, and before long, he was out in, a, in an aviary with lots of other feral pigeons. And we, we sort of uh, get them all up to a good weight. They're all flying. They're all being feral and wild as we want them to be. And then they'll get released somewhere that's suitable for feral pigeons. And in this case, he made a full recovery um, before being released. Uh, last of the case studies here. Um, We've got a fox cub. Uh, this was right at the beginning of lockdown. You know, if you all cast your minds back to the first lockdown, uh, no, none of us knew what was going to happen, what was going to happen with COVID. What did lockdown really mean? It, in our sector of work, the original lockdown, it wasn't very clear. What we did know within our sector of work is that legally speaking, any animal that comes into the care of, of someone because you picked it up, um, or you found it unwell or injured, there is a legal obligation for that animal to, to receive treatment and care. So it'd actually be a crime to not do that. So um, we were operating on that originally before the government clarified a few days later that wildlife rescue was indeed an essential service. So this individual, three days into lockdown, we get a call about a fox cub in someone's garden, which is not uncommon. You know, sometimes mom's around and the fox cubs start playing around. And, and you know, it, it's, not the, it's not uncommon to have. However, this fox was behaving very strange. Um, it was very tame. It was trying to play with the people. There was no sign of the mother fox or any other cubs around. And on top of that, much to the confusion of the finder, and they couldn't understand how the fox got in the garden in the first place because it was a tall wooden fence all the way around. Uh, and indeed, I struggled to, to work out how, how it had gotten in there. By the time we arrived, um, we, we got there. The fox was actually inside their kitchen um, and it was playing 
with with them they were playing a sort of a game with a dog toy with it not that i'd advise this i'd recommend um securing the fox cab away but nonetheless it was um and we went in and we were able to to catch the fox uh, and, and bring it back uh, to heart and sometimes with fox cubs there are various diseases and viruses they can get and adult foxes that can lead them to appearing tame um, and we were worried that that was the case at first um, but it didn't seem to be now fox cubs are a bit of a nightmare in wildlife rescue because we all get inundated with them uh, we've got to keep them all the way through till september and as you can imagine, there, there are a lot of work uh, and, and trying to find safe places to release them uh, is, is an additional challenge. So, so we're all inundated with them. And sometimes you end up with a fox cub uh, really early. Now, we had our first fox cub in February, the start of February in 2020. We didn't get another fox cub all the way through uh, until the beginning of March. Now, as with many animals, you want to try to rear them with their own kind. It's really important that they learn what they are and they learn their social skills from one another rather than from humans because you'll end up with all sorts of problems otherwise and it makes your job a lot harder to wild them up. This individual when he came in was too big, was too old for our younger fox cub that we had. So we actually knew of another rescue center um, over towards uh, sort of Somerset way uh, that also had a fox cub about the same age and thankfully we gave them a call and they were very happy to take him on uh, to keep their fox cub company. So wildlife rescue centers, we all work with each other across the country within a reasonable distance. Obviously, you don't want to send animals off on very long journeys, um, but we all keep in touch and we all work together uh, to make sure that, that obviously, you know, if someone's got one of something and they're looking for a pair or looking for more for the sake of that animal actually making it through the rehabilitation process, then we can actually do that. Um, so this individual uh, was then transferred off to there. Which brings me nicely on to what to do if you find an injured animal. Now, if you find an injured animal, the advice is actually quite simple. The first thing I'd always say is if it's safe to do so. Now, this is the key detail. In the hierarchy of how we assess uh, any emergency situation, whether it's human or animal, the original person that comes across the scene, you have to guarantee their safety first. So it's really important that if it's on a road, um, if it's near fast flowing water or near a, a, a large drop, a, a deep drop, that, that you assess the situation is safe first. If the situation is safe, the next bit of advice is to try to contain the animal. Now, if you're not sure, because it, the rules will differ by species and it's impossible to list all the different rules out there. One rule for foxes, another rule for leverets, another rule for, for, for young um, geese and things. So the best advice is to try to contain the animal. And that may well be at the scene. It may be just covering its head. If it's a fox, um, deer, badger, or a seal, um, trying to cover its head with a towel, with a jumper, something that's going to keep the animal calm. And again, only if it's safe to do so. If it's a smaller animal, a bird, um, a, a rodent, a hedgehog, uh, of course, you can contain that within a box, on a towel, in a dark box, and cover it up keeping it nice and calm, really quiet. And then the next thing you're going to do really is call your nearest wildlife rescue center, which for the vast majority of you on here is going to be us. And our, our number is there. If you don't know it, please take a note of it. Um, if you can't get a hold of us for some reason, or you find yourself stuck in, at three o'clock in the morning and, and for whatever reason you can't reach us on our mobiles, then you've got the RSPCA number as well. So these are the two numbers you can call. Um, if you find an orphaned animal, however, a baby mammal, baby, what you think is a baby hedgehog, uh, or even a fox cub or a young badger, we always recommend taking a step back, looking around and really observing the scene if it's safe to do so, to look for any sign of either other potential orphans that are in the area, or indeed parents um, uh, and, and you know, any conspecifics that might make sense for it being there. If you're not sure, sure um, always call a rescue centre before intervening. Unfortunately, um, every single year, there are hundreds of baby animals that come into rescue centres across the country, it'll be thousands that come into rescue centres that don't really need to. Um, obviously, well-meaning members of the public that care, care deeply. Um, a lot of this is focused around fledgling birds and things and this confusion about whether or not they should be on the ground. Um, but if you're unsure, just give us a ring. 
So if you're interested in, in helping us as an organization, um, there are lots of ways you can help us and, and, and any wildlife rescue center, really. Um, we take physical donations in the forms of old towels, newspapers, uh, cat meat and cat biscuits. At some times of year, dog meat and dog biscuits are useful as well. But for the most part, cat meat and cat biscuits are what we go through all year round. Um, of course, you can donate financially to the charity. Uh, it costs approximately, if you average out all the patients through the year, around 100, 150 pounds a patient throughout the year. And um, that's down, of course, a big part of that is the veterinary care, the medication, the treatment and the vet visits. Um, if you'd like to buy items for us, we have an Amazon wish list. Um, this is where we list all of the items we currently need. Uh, it varies from pens and admin materials to rescue equipment to food for the animals. You can, of course, host a fundraiser for us. Um, when COVID-19 has calmed down again, um, which who knows when that's going to be, but hopefully we're not too far away, um, you can become a volunteer. Now, volunteers come in a whole variety of shapes and sizes. That could be a volunteer that helps in the charity shop in Alton. It could be a volunteer that will pick up animals for us and bring them into us. So for example, uh, let's say someone finds a hedgehog in Winchester and they can't drive it to us and, and they, they're, they're asking for someone to pick it up. We often go through our volunteer driver list um, to do that. And of course, there are volunteers that help us with maintenance on the field. We always need people that are, have got some good DIY skills to help with building sheds, painting sheds, setting up cages um, and general sort of sort of uh, DIY stuff out there. Uh, and indeed, there are opportunities throughout the year to volunteer in the hospital as well for those that can volunteer regularly uh, and have an interest in that side of the work. Um, you can also uh, visit our charity shop in Alton. Uh, it's in the car park near the community centre. Um, and we, we've got a lot of items in there, which, of course, you can drop off items there uh, to use it to be sold in the charity shop as well as visit yourself. For more information, you can visit our website uh, in the Help Us section. If you'd like to keep up to date with HEART and if you're interested in wildlife and like to follow our cases, we pretty much every single day we post throughout the year um, current patients in the hospital. Um, either some cases that we follow through using the social media, um, others it's the patient of the day. It could be an interesting patient or um, you know, just an individual that we'd like to share with you. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you can also follow us um, and subscribe to our, our newsletter as well and receive our, our e-news and various stories from the hospital that come out through the year. And again, that can all be done on our website. Right, now we're going to move on to the question side. And please do write your questions in the chat if you have any questions. Um, our email address is down here as well. You can also find it on the website. And I'm going to hand back over. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Eleanor now, who's going to feed the questions back to me. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, we've got some, some really great questions coming through, actually. Uh, so without further ado, let's have a little look. Um, so the first question that we had through was from Lorna, who said, have there been any problems with face masks? So particularly being caught around animals, have you seen that happen? So we ourselves haven't had any cases of entanglement with, with face masks, but I'm sure all of us here have seen on social media, there are lots of animals getting caught in them, particularly seabirds and aquatic uh, animals, because of course, a lot of these masks get blown into waterways and they get blown into, onto the beach or into the ocean on the beach. So, so we have seen lots of cases online, but into heart, thankfully not. No, that's good. Um, lots of people concerned with um, the picture of the hedgehog that you showed who had his nose amputated and wanted to know what the outcome of that story was. So thankfully, that individual managed to make it back. Now, with partial nose amputations, you have to be very careful. And it all comes down to how well that nose heals up. And the wounds often, as you saw in that case, they're very swollen initially. It looks very dramatic. Uh, and there's a query as to how, how functional that nose is going to be after. But once the swelling subsides and the tissue heals, uh, what you need is the, 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 the epithelial cells, the surface, the skin cells to come back uh, with that wet nose so that it can effectively use its sense of smell uh, in the future, which obviously makes up a big part 
of, of how they forage. And in this case, uh, it was a, a functional, uh, what was deemed a functional nose in the end. Uh, we see them sniffing around with their food in the hospital. As soon as we start preparing the food in the morning, you're going to see lots of hedgehogs and their noses twitching and they sniff up in the air and they all start getting very active. Um, and indeed, this individual was, uh, was one that was. Nice to have a good news, good news story there. On the subject of hedgehogs, um, Yvette's asking, how do you spot a hedgehog nest? Well, there is no set way as to how, how hedgehogs nest. What they do is they look for somewhere that's warm and, and relatively dry, but not completely dry. And this is where people get confused. Everyone expects hedgehogs to go into a hedgehog house or to be uh, almost, some people think they burrow, that there'll be in little divots in the ground. What they tend to do is pull vegetation and material over the top of them and, and go to sleep under it. And that can be out in the open under a pile of leaves. Um, equally, we, have an, we had an awful lot of cases this year where hedgehogs were nesting in plastic bags. So people ended up clearing up garden rubbish. Perhaps it was a compost bag. Um, perhaps it was just a, in one case, it was literally a pile of rubbish in someone's garden, literal garbage. Uh, and the hedgehog had pulled all the plastic in a plastic bag and had a nest within it with babies uh, and some contractors were clearing up the garden, throwing away the waste, and they saw the bag moving. They thought that it was rats inside. Um, they had a look inside, and of course, and found this mother and her babies. Uh, thankfully, they brought it into us, and we were able to keep mom with babies. Um, that's something that doesn't always work, but in this case, we kept mom with babies. She reared them all. Uh, they all became uh, nice and large and they were all released, um, sadly not back to where they came from in this case because it was a, a sort of demolition sort of job that was going on there, but they were released nearby into a supported garden uh, in the summer. So the nest itself isn't always clear. You, you might find them in a garden border, uh, and, and you might find them under a tree, you might find them in your garage, in a bin, in rubbish. There isn't an absolute, but there will always be a layer of something on top of them. That's, that's what they're going for, some kind of material or substrate. Great. Um, Julia is asking about the area that animals come from um, that, that get admitted to heart. If you could say a little bit more about that. So, Generally speaking, if we look at wildlife rescue centres, large official, you know, re rescue centres in Hampshire, you've got ourselves in, in near Alton, and then you've got another rescue near Ringwood. Um, for general wildlife rescue, that's it for Hampshire. Now, so that means that pretty much all patients that are wildlife, general wildlife will come into us. There are smaller hedgehog rescues and, and um, mostly small hedgehog rescues knocking around. Um, there aren't really anywhere that take care of birds uh, other than us and, a, and the odd uh, individual around Hampshire. So we cover all of Hampshire, most of Surrey. Uh, a lot of wildlife in Surrey will also go to wildlife aid in Leatherhead, um, but we do get an awful lot from Surrey. Um, the odd hedgehogs from Berkshire, um, there was a large hedgehog rescue in Berkshire that shut down, um, well, te has temporarily shut down, so we had an awful lot of calls from Berkshire this year. Um, and we get the occasional thing down uh, sort of Dorset way, but for the most part, wildlife should go into their nearest um, sort of professional wildlife rescue centre or hospital, um, because then, of course, it's going to get the best care and the animal doesn't have to spend a long time uh, in transport because it's a, it's a legal issue as well as a welfare issue. You want them to get into somewhere as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And just to reiterate that slide that you saw in Paul's um, presentation, last year, the figure of the number of the total number of animals admitted to heart was 3,233. So we believe we're one of the biggest, if not the biggest animal rescue in the, the county. Um, there's quite a few questions, Paul, about unusual uh, patients and, and strange patients and, and uh, what kind of animals you've seen. People are asking if you've ever seen um, otters if you've ever treated an insect and what the strangest animal is that's been to heart that you've seen? Uh, okay, uh, that's a, an interesting question. Um, I've never, we've never treated an insect, although uh, I did have a call once when I was in Scotland about a butterfly with one wing. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, obviously there's not a lot we can do about a one wing butterfly, um, but they're not very common. Um, as for unusual patients, I think 
what tends to happen that the shock factor for us is when we've assumed it is one thing and it's indeed something else so I guess the most interesting patient that was exotic of the year was that rear that was fascinating I, I've never uh, been up close with a young rear before it was a wonderful creature very interesting animal um, but the most shocking was not that exciting but it was the opening the box when you're expecting uh, uh, a sort of someone says oh I've got a I've got a duck and it's a baby pigeon I've got a pheasant and it was the white cockerel that leapt out you know uh, that, that's really for us the the shock factor is when we're really we've got our mindset that it's one thing and it ends up being something else and and you know for all the will in the world people do misidentify things uh, from veterinary practices to just normal members of the public we get this expectation that we've got one thing coming in uh, and it's not uncommon for it to be something completely different uh, if you ever hear someone on the phone and they're saying i think it's some kind of bird of prey it's got a really big beak um, but it's really small it's really fluffy it's got really big feet it's almost always going to be a baby wood pigeon uh, and we we see that from all over the place everyone thinks it's a baby uh, something really exciting and then I say to them oh it's a baby wood pigeon and unfortunately there's a lot of disappointment when they think they've got something really exotic and fascinating and it is indeed just a, a baby wood pigeon do you think we've ever have you ever had an otter you can't oh uh, otters no, there was an otter once into heart before my time uh, unfortunately it arrived uh, moribund it was on its way out uh, and, and it didn't make it but they're actually not a common uh, rescue and in fact across the UK very few rescues have facilities for otters and the UK Wild Otter Trust take in the the vast majority of young otters because uh, that's quite a common occurrence uh, they get sent up to them but uh, but very few have facilities to to take on adult otters um, partly because they they spend so long in captivity if you have a young otter in you're going to have it for a whole year before it can be released um, and during that year, you need to make sure they don't become tame, uh, which is obviously a, quite a challenge. So they tend to go off to a, the few specialist rescue centres around the country. Okay, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, we've probably got uh, time for a, a one or two more. Um, interesting comment from uh, Victoria, who said, what happens when you're full? Um, what should people do? Who else can they call? Which is a really interesting point, given that um, Hart was not shut last year, which is, I think, um, you know, I'm really, really proud that, that Hart was able to operate throughout lockdown. And I think all credit to, to Paul and the team for, for doing that. But it's a really good question. Paul, what do you advise? So this is the, the big dilemma. And for Hart, you know, our, our admissions did peak several times last year. We were never shut to all admissions. We were always capable of taking in um, certain species. But there are times of year where due to the nature of a certain species and the care they require or the longevity they require in captivity, we can become full. A good example of that is corvids. So jackdaws, uh, jays, magpies, crows, ravens, and so on, all the corvids, when you have them in as youngsters, they can't be released until after the breeding season, which, depending on the species, it varies, but you're talking July, September, between July and September, the breeding series, se uh, season by species starts to end. So with the crows, for example, you can't release until September. Therefore, you get full of baby crows come sort of May time. You can't take any more on because you just don't have the space or the aviary space to take them on. So we'd have to turn them away. Now, that's true with fox cubs as well. Uh, it's true with lots of paper ducklings. There's only so many we can do. At one point, we had 80 ducklings on site uh, at heart. They everywhere was full. We had no, no more space to put them. So the sad reality is when we are full, the only options thereafter are, are to your next nearest rescue center which from us is either Wiltshire Wildlife Hospital in Amesbury or Wildlife Aid in Leatherhead or Brent Lodge in Chichester. So you're going to be driving another 40 minutes to an hour on from us and that is not always appropriate or not always possible for someone to do. Now this is a, an issue obviously that we have at heart at the moment is that our, our need, the, the need for our service uh, outweighs our, our current capacity and, and it's something that we are obviously working on and we are very keen to push ahead with this year in, in, in sort of you know in being able to increase uh, the size of, of our facility because currently there are far too many animals that need rescue uh, beyond even what, what we can deal with and of course when we're full 
you can guarantee that everybody else is full. If you're in wildlife aid in Leatherhead in Surrey, you're full of fox cubs, probably around the same time we're full of fox cubs. And if they do have space, rescue centers are sometimes reluctant to start taking from outside their area because they know full well they're going to have many more coming in from their immediate surrounds, which obviously uh, has to be a priority. So it, it, it is an issue when we're full. The RSPCA, your local veterinary practice, the good thing with the RSPCA is they can transport it to their larger facilities in Somerset um, and over on the East Coast if they need to. So with the RSPCA, they've got a lot more flexibility with transport um, than perhaps members of the public would have or indeed individual wildlife rescues. Absolutely. Um, I think that that moves very, very nicely into the last thing really that I want to say before we hand back to Simon. Um, I'm just going to see if I can share my screen with you very briefly. Um, there we go. So um, as Paul was saying, it's, it's been a busy year. It looks like it's going to be another busy year um, uh, in, in 2021. This is actually our 25th anniversary year, um, if you missed that at the beginning of the talk. So it's, it's great that Heart is still around, but what we really need to do is to be around for another 25 years and, and, you know, and, and more. Um, sadly, the need is, is not lessening. The need is increasing for wildlife to be rescued. Um, a lot of that is coming through climate change and habitat loss that is, and man-made challenges, as you've heard uh, through a lot of those case studies. We are entirely funded by donations. Um, the charity shop, which Paul mentioned, is a fantastic thing to have, but of course, sadly, is currently shut due to lockdown. Um, normally, we would get about, raise around £6,000 in a good month through the charity shop. So we have struggled, certainly, in the last, in the last year. Um, you know, thankfully, due to the, the support of, of, um, of Hearts donors and all those who've helped, it's been amazing and, you know, we've been able to, to rescue those, those 3,000 plus animals. Um, our ambition for the next 25 years is definitely to move from premises which we currently rent. Um, we've got a, a, we're very lucky, we've got a wildlife loving landlord who, who lets us have our, our premises and, and the field um, to rent. But what we would ideally like to do is to build premises. Um, and so that's going to be something you're going to hear us talking about a little more in the coming uh, months. Um, if you want to know more about it, by all means sign up to our emails, which are on the Heart website. Um, if you can share any of our posts on social media um, or with your friends and family, that would be fantastic. Uh, and yes, if you are keen to, to hear more about the, the campaign and if you're able to help or support, um, we'd love to have you with us. I think it's going to be really, really exciting. Um, more information, as Paul said, is on our website. So it's under heartwildlife.org, help us. So if you're able to, that would be amazing. Thank you so much for, uh, to Paul for that amazing talk. Sorry we didn't get around to every question. We'll try and answer some of them in the chat box before we finish the meeting. Um, and uh, I will pass back to Simon. I've just got to unmute and you. I'll unmute myself. So, thank you very much, Paul and Eleanor. That was absolutely amazing. I learned loads, and everyone looked like they were really enjoying the uh, the session there. So, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I look forward to following your exploits on Facebook and such like. And again, we're we're glad to see uh, some things going on within Winchester. I I remember the Winchester Swan uh, myself uh, down at Garnier Road. So yeah. The, it, it's amazing to see the work that you do. Um, also looking forward to some of the activities that you've got going on to celebrate your 25th anniversary. So um, I know the a campaign to uh, come up with a new logo and things like that, I think. So uh, So hopefully again, we'll get some people involved from Wild Winchester on that. Uh, uh, hopefully some uh, younger members who'll uh, be watching this as well, either tonight or over the next few days. A reminder to everyone on here that this has been recorded, so I will share the details as soon as uh, Paul and Eleanor share them with me. Um, but yeah, encourage, if you've enjoyed this and encourage your friends, family to watch it as well, because this has been fantastic. And hopefully at some point we'll have Heart back to do a more specific talk on something. If people are showing an interest in, you know, particularly hedgehogs or something like that, then maybe um, once the hedgehogs are coming out of hibernation, then we can maybe get a, a, a hedgehog specific talk or something like that. Definitely. So thank you very much again. Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, and hopefully you've 
you know, really taking something away on this. Um, I hope to catch you all on the group soon. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, have a good evening. Thank you again, Paul and Eleanor. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.